I can't not be long uranium here. I just can't not be long here. Uh, the, the price is going to continue to move higher. This may be worth talking about what, what stocks you think will be performing from here on. Up. Compared to the price of the metal here, the miners are underperforming. They really are. And we think that ships. And that's where our bet is. As in, what I'm asking you is developers, producers, explorers, something else. What are you looking at? Huge upside for United States uranium producing companies. Thank you for being so generous. By the way, I think you, you, you're giving away quite a lot of good information here. As far as the investment case for SMRs, I think we're very, very early in that stage still. First of all, thank you for asking my question for me and then also answering it. That's kind of a nice podcast. I can basically just record you and I don't have to do anything else. <laughs> but <laughs> I don't want a price spike, but the market doesn't always give me what I want. In fact, it almost never does. All right, Justin. Um, last week, I interviewed John Champaglia, and uh, somewhere in there, I asked him if the um, if the spot market was behaving differently right now, as in, you know, looking at just everybody who participates, like the carry traders and their activity over the last few months, um, BHP and whatnot, and whether that was different. And so he basically concluded by saying, yes, it is quite different. The market is generally quite different, become quite different over the last year. Uh, but I saw a tweet of yours uh, this week. It got me thinking about exactly how different it is and, and why it might be that different. Because you tweeted, and I'm going to quote quote that in here, November month to date has seen the lowest monthly spot uranium, uh, uranium traded volume in 18 months, yet the spot price has moved up 10%, uh, unquote. So what, is, what does that mean? What's causing it? Who's to blame? What's going on? I wish I could show you a chart that is uh, put out by UXC, but I can't because it's copyrighted material. But it's basically alligator jaws showing volume on one end and the price on the other. And so the volume, especially over the past five to six months, the trading volume in the spot market has been declining month over month. <clears throat> and this last month, in fact, the tweet still had a couple of days left in the month to go, which is why I said month to date, but November, 2023, in fact, was the lowest spot traded volume in terms of total pounds traded for uh, for a single month in the last 18 months. And yet we did see a 10% jump in the price. So we've seen the, the spot market trading volume decline over the past six months. And the price has been has gone up in the last six months has gone up what something about 50%. It's been a major increase in the price and a, a declining rate of trading in the spot market. So, I mean, basically put it really simply, the spot market is, is very, very thin. And what's happening now is that <clears throat> to everyone in the industry and all of the players that are typically buying and selling in the spot market, especially selling, are very clearly recognizing this price trend and are holding on more tightly to pounds. Um, inventories always exist in this industry and, and they always will, and they exist for a reason. They exist because of the time that it takes for material to run through the fuel cycle processes to go from mined uranium into fabricated fuel. And you have to hold inventories. Otherwise you risk as a utility, otherwise you risk not having material to operate your plant. That's a non-starter. You can't, you can't have that happen, but, um, inventories by traders and any other players that typically are sellers in the market tend to be held more tightly as the price is rising. And that's that can be somewhat counterintuitive, especially from an investment perspective, because buy low, sell high, right? So when uranium was $30, $40 a pound, you're thinking, okay, we're going to hit $65, $70, $75 a pound, and we're going to start to see the Japanese sell out inventories. We know there's plenty of Japanese utilities that put pounds on their books at relatively high prices, and maybe they'll be dishing pounds out when we reach that price again, just to clear their books off. Um, maybe there's some other entities sitting on large amounts of uranium, specifically the Chinese that might be selling uranium into the market when we hit a price that's significant. And, and nobody has really been able to pin that price down and say exactly why those inventories would come into the market at XYZ price. Uh, then just a loose theory that we reach some arbitrary number and all of a sudden pounds will start flowing into the market. And thus far, that's been a hundred percent incorrect. The evidence is absolutely opposite of that. And who nailed it was Mike Alkin, um, even back in the early days, 2016, 2017, 2018, and, uh, basically saying in commodities markets, what you often see is a rising price means inventories are held more tightly because <clears throat> if you're a trader, you have no real incentive necessarily to be buying and selling uranium. You're just trying to profit from your business of trading. 
and you're holding 500,000 pounds and you are, you want to sell that. Maybe you have an off take that you get pounds at the, um, you know, every month. Why would you sell it right now at 81 bucks a pound? Maybe if you hold those pounds for another three days, you can sell at 85. And that's the mentality that's in the market right now. Pounds are being held more tightly. Um, and you also have some other elements, which is certain entities that have historically been marginal spot market sellers have turned to buyers this year. Uh, specifically, I'm talking about some Chinese and Russian entities um, as well as others, but those, those what came to mind when I said that. You have that happening. And then you also have uh, you know rumors such as BHP, which typically has been a spot market seller or sometimes selling short to midterm spot reference contracts, garnering some pressure from utilities to uh, enter into midterm and long-term contracts rather than selling into the spot market. So that perhaps could be removing some typically consistent pounds that will filter into the spot market currently. Either way, it's very, very, very thin. And how thin is it? Last week, was it last week? No, I think it was the week prior when we saw a pretty big jump in the spot price. We saw a $3 jump in the spot price on zero pounds traded. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you can see actually a pretty big uh, bid ask spread in the spot market. <clears throat> and a lot of times it'll jump up and it'll come right back down a little bit. Um, but we're seeing big price moves on very, very little volume. And uh, from this is this is unique uh, for as long as I've been watching the market. But you know, continuing my conversations with industry analysts and people that have been working in this industry for longer than I've been alive, what they're telling me is that they've never seen the market like this before in, in their entire careers. I mean, folks like Dustin Garrow from Nuclear Fuel Associates, who's been working in the nuclear industry for pushing 50 years, he said this is an anomaly. He's never seen a market this thin. And the unique element of seeing such a thin market is that it hasn't come from some exogenous event. It's been a very long time coming. Yes, financial buying, specifically from Sprott, certainly accelerated this trend, but it's basically been a low price environment. Production came offline. Utilities got lazy. They bought up carry trades as long as they could. The producers were hurting. All of the companies, except for a few dozen, disappeared. Went from 500 companies to less than 50. Um, the industry was going through a lot of pain. Comradine shut down, MacArthur River shut down, Langer Heinrich shut down. I mean, major mines, major operations shut down. That was extremely, extremely painful for these people. Then it started to turn and the utilities did not act quickly enough to incentivize production. Now we have this situation where there's very, very little supply available um, above ground and mobile inventory, just cake in a can. It's just not there. And we have a slow delayed process of new supply coming online in this period of time where there's a lot of buying ahead of us in terms of utilities covering their uncovered needs without having supply response. It's an extremely unique period. Um, we expect the price to continue to move higher. Everybody who knows anything about this market uh, believes the same thing. Hmm. And that reminds me of your pin tweet though, because it's, it's also interesting. It's, it's, um, I believe it's from this year, somewhere around the summer, maybe it's from September, August, September, something like that, where you basically say that you've um you've not been in the uranium spike camp, but that you, you believe sort of a gradual increase in the spot price of uranium is more likely. But so given what you're telling me here, is that is that still the, the case for you or is still in that same camp or do you think a spike is becoming more likely? Well, I think actually in that tweet, I believe that I say that I'm leaning towards it's becoming more likely um, mm. that I haven't historically have not been in that camp. And when when Sprott came on the scene, of course, it's kind of ridiculous to not at least recognize the potential for a price spike with seeing the, the incredible influence that the financials can have on the market when capital is really flowing. Um, part of me doesn't want a price spike. I, you know, because there, there is a nuclear advocate side of me that has absolutely nothing to do with the investing thesis and price spikes are not good for the industry. They don't help the producers at all. Um, the last time this happened in 07, you know, one company got into production that was Paladin. Um, every single other company that was quote unquote developing, the price spiked and crashed too quickly 
for those uh, entities to do what they needed to do to get into production. So there was not a high enough price for a longer period of time for that to happen. Now, I don't think we have the same conditions to allow for that same situation. That's not to say we don't have the conditions for a price spike. I believe that we do. What we don't have is near-term supply that can quell that price spike. Now, in a in the thinly traded spot market, certainly financial entities, um, because it's not just sprot that holds pounds, right? There's there's hedge funds, there's individual family offices that hold pounds, and some of those pounds can come back into the market. But if we have such a significant and drastic supply shortfall on an annual basis year over year, it's going to take a lot of uranium being sold into the market to really suppress prices. Hmm. I don't know if we see that. Um, all the ingredients are there for a price spike. All of the ingredients, a thinly traded market, multiple financial entities in play, more coming. All it needs is capital to flow into those vehicles. And I don't have a prediction on when that will happen, but I do believe that these vehicles are not set up for nothing. Um, and I think that there's plenty of, plenty of periods of time in the past historical evidence of capital markets and financial players smelling blood and going after a market that can be squeezed. So I think that it's increasingly likely that it does happen. Even the very conservative um, you know, nuclear fuel consultants such as UXC are flagging to their readership, which are nuclear utilities, look out for a price spike, the financials could smell blood, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So I don't want a price spike. Um, it's It can be exciting from an investment speculation point of view, but honestly, a uh, more slowly grinding rising price is healthier for, for the industry. In some cases, it can be healthier from the investment case as well. But the market doesn't always give me what I want. In fact, it almost never does. So I think that um, I think that a spike is likely. Even the industry analysts like UXC are surprised at how quickly the price spiked over the last three months. Um, everybody knew the price was going higher. I've been saying it for a year. Um, we're headed higher. We're headed higher. I'm still saying it. Eighty-one dollars. We're going way higher. Um, nobody knew it was going to rise this fast in this little volume. So. And there's no reason for the price to be $81. There's no, there's no reason it's 81 and not 71 and not 91. Mm. Right. Because what is $81 doing for the industry? Is there a near term producer that needs $81 spot in order to turn their processes on? No, there's not. Is there someone selling uh, large amounts of supply at $81? And that's why we reached that price and stopped. No, there's not. It's it's literally just the mentality of the buyers and sellers currently and the sentiment that's in the spot market currently. Um, and of course, just the the absolutely thin amount of supply. So we're what we're seeing is sort of a, a standoff in the spot market on very, very little supply. And there's no real reason that the price is here and not way, way higher or even lower. There's no reason that it's not. We're just in this trend and the trend is higher. Um, with all of that said, you can, of course, calculate the marginal pound and say, okay, the marginal pound from from Forces uh, that still needs to put three, four hundred million dollars into CapEx to develop a low grade mine in Namibia. Um, I'm just using them as an example, right? What's the marginal pound? The marginal pound is the low grade uranium in large quantities, right? Mm -hmm. So that are going to be needed, these projects in Namibia from Deep Yellow and Bannerman and Forces and various others, they're going to be needed at some point, you know, late decade, early 2030s, it's going to be needed. If, if the trajectory of nuclear continues as it is, and if like, if the COP28 um, proclamations from the United States and its 10 buddies that are supposedly signing on to this, to this intention to triple nuclear by 2050 globally. I mean, I can't even believe we're hearing this, Antonio. I, I really can't. Like this is, this is profound and not something I ever thought I would even hear um, since I've been watching this market. So it's crazy. So these projects are needed and wh what price do they actually need? Okay. Well, Bannerman's feasibility study two years ago needed Seventy dollars, sixty-five, seventy dollars off the top of my head. What is that now? Ninety, a hundred. 
let's just say the Nam Namibian projects need $100 a pound. Okay, that's where the market needs to go. That has absolutely nothing to do with sentiment in a thinly traded market. And when we might end up seeing a situation where the utilities that are last to act are clamoring over um, limited available pounds, we're going to see prices go far, far beyond that, just mm. based on need. Mm. Yeah, I'm sure a couple of people are already triggered just by you mentioning Namibia. So the comment section is going to be interesting. But yes, no, I'm, I'm not anti Namibia. I mean, I'm pro Namibia. I'm all about Namibia. Uh, Namibia is great. It's a historical production. I'm just trying to highlight. Okay, so there's other, you know, dry mine developments. They're just smaller. Like all the US stuff in Utah is like, you know, in the similar price range, it's just a few million pounds, not 200 million pounds. Mm -hmm. So these are the big projects that do need to get built. That's why I'm highlighting Namibia. Mm -hmm. No, I think I, uh, I think I got that part, but you, you bring up an interesting point though, that um, to go back to what you were talking about, the spot market is there's no reason, there's no reason the price shouldn't be here or higher or lower. And, um, I saw this week something that on Twitter that many people basically many people were freaking out earlier in the week about an RFP that was posted in the market. It was a it was a three hundred thousand pound RFP for delivery in January. RFP request for proposal. This basically someone wants to buy uranium. They're going out there and they're saying, "Hey, we want to buy uranium. Um, give us proposals, request for proposals." But that's in less than two months. And so people freaked out saying that the spot market is empty because this is normally a transaction that would happen on the spot market. It's small enough. It's not small, but it's small enough and it's short term enough for it to happen on the spot market. But they're now trying the long term market, basically, uh, and maybe not getting filled in the spot market. So I asked around when that happened. So I have an opinion. Uh, but what do you what do you make of that? Well, there's a couple of things I think that are worth considering is um RFPs don't only exist as a secondary option when you cannot simply go buy the material. That's not that's not exactly how RFPs work. Um, in a lot of cases, a buyer may be actually required to put out an RFP to get competitive offers. Hmm. That might actually be a requirement by the utility or the governing body of the utility. So they might not be able to just go in the market and buy what they need. They might actually have to say, hey, we need offers for this material. And then they'll go for the low offer, whatever it might be. Um, the other thing to consider is that January delivery at Comradine is tricky right now. That's six weeks from right now. So that's very, very, very fast for actual cake in a can settlement. And at Comradine, Comradine just restarted this year. So there's a lot of conversion uh, services booked at this facility. And there's been a lot of U308 demand at this facility to fulfill into those conversion services and those conversion contracts. So um, while there isn't a, a huge uh, location premium at Converdine currently, to get filled even on, on a small quantity at Converdine in a short period of time is a little bit tricky at this particular moment in time. Um, the other thing that I think is a bit of an error. Now, now it could be that they couldn't buy 300,000 pounds at Converdine and they did an RFP instead. That is possible. But I think that's less likely than the fact that they probably were required to put an RFP to get competitive bids. Um, the next thing I think is, is to try to not imagine the spot market as like a physical location, like a physical market where there's material or there isn't. And when it's gone, it's gone. That's not what the spot market is. The spot market is a period of time. It's a, it's a settlement of less than 12 months <clears throat> for a global market for this commodity with multiple uh, delivery locations for U308. And so to say that the spot market is dry or is empty is not really pretty much ever an accurate statement. There's always going to be some material being sold by someone um, between now and 12 months from now. And uh, because there's, all, there's producers that sell exclusively into the spot market or have offtakes, right? So like like Navoy, which is a state-owned uh, uranium miner in Uzbekistan. They have offtakes with a number of traders. And on a monthly basis, these traders get material. And they're not uh, end-user utilities. They're, they're physical commodities traders. That's what they do. They get that offtake and they sell it. So there's pretty much always going to be some material being bought and sold between uh, in, in less than a 12-month settlement period. So to say like the spot market is dry and there is nothing there, that's 
pretty much always going to be an inaccurate statement. Mm-hmm. Um, with all of that said, it's extremely, extremely thin here. And to my point about the pricing and why it's 81, not 71 or 91. The reason it's 81 right now is because when it drops to 80, $80 and 50 cents, buyers step in. It, I mean, that's that's the only reason the, the price is, is where it is right now. It's because the buying is more aggressive than the selling. And that's pretty basic. That's the, the way things are in every single market. When the buying is more aggressive than the selling, the price rises. And that's just where we're at right now. Hmm. Hmm. That's a simpler explanation. So I guess Q to utilities are panicking tweets for now. Um, but this is also, and I also want to go back to a, a point that you previously made about this this being or not being the incentive price for companies to push towards uh, bringing new production online or restarting brownfield assets or whatever it might be. So what, one more recent example of that is Encore Energy announcing that they were started uranium production at their Texas ISR facility uh, this week, actually. And it's probably a few more to come online throughout 2024 that are happy with this price. So how how would you even judge what the incentive price is right now? That's that's a really good question. I, I don't even know that I would. Um, I think pretty much every company that's producing currently is very pleased with the price environment. Okay. While at the same time, the existing producers, especially the large producers, have mostly contracted their production for the next four to five years. And what I'm hearing across the industry is that these same uh, producers that have done heavy contracting in the last few years for their forward production for the next three to five <clears throat> have started to kind of step back a little bit hmm. and are um, obviously shifting towards market reference contracts. They all know where the price is going, which is higher. Nobody knows a number, but everybody, everyone, it's universal across the industry right now even amongst the utilities. And that's really important to recognize. The price is not going down. So everybody knows this and the producers are going to want to do what they can to benefit from that. So Cameco, for example, which is um, pretty highly hedged to lower prices based on previous contracts that they signed are starting to pull back and are uh, signing fewer contracts, being more careful about those contracts that they signed and these contracts are mostly, if not entirely, market referenced with pretty high, you know, floors, you know, a little bit less than where we're at, probably closer to the term market price, which is 66 bucks a pound now. And with ceilings, now we're hearing ceilings. And I'm talking necessarily Cameco specifically, but generally speaking, contracts that are going out late decade in the 2030s, the ceilings are pushing three digits and higher. So everybody knows where the price is going. What is the incentive price? I don't even think that's a question that needs to be answered now because the incentive price is basically here for most projects. And the projects that can come online are working towards coming online. So that's Boss in Australia with an ISR project. That's um, Encore Energy and Peninsula and UR Energy, Energy Fuels, UEC, and the, all of these companies that have ISR projects in the United States. They don't have a lot of annual production on an individual basis, but they're all moving towards production because they can make a, a tidy profit selling, you know, 100,000 pounds a month into the spot market, right? I mean, that doesn't sound like a lot, but for these small producers, that adds up. Then, of course, uh, Cameco is getting MacArthur and Cigar uh, uh, projected to be full production next year. And Denison is working towards development. Next Gen is working towards development, et cetera, et cetera. Paladin's coming back online. So <clears throat> the projects that can come online are, what I find strange is coming back to Namibia, these large projects in Namibia with, from DPLO and Forces and Bannerman, they seem oddly quiet. Do they not? Seem oddly quiet. Um, we're at 81 bucks a pound here. Hmm. So either they still need higher prices or they're just biding their time intelligently waiting for the market to continue to move up and move up and move up until the utilities get to a point where they're like, damn it. Okay. John calling up Borshoff and saying, what do you need? Uh, we're ready to sign. And he might sign some of his forward production at $120 a pound and get into production. I don't really know. I don't know exactly what their plan is, but I find it interesting that those projects are, are oddly quiet. Mm. So what is the incentive price? I still go back to the marginal cost of production for those projects. You know, it's probably $100 a pound and probably moving up pretty quickly with with inflation. So probably somewhere in that ballpark would be my my very long-winded, simple answer. 
it, I've been thinking about that too after since really I interviewed John Borshoff. And I think the 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 incentive price for the Namibian project is is whatever John Borshoff wants because he's got the upper hand right now. Because when I asked him, he had previously said that 65 is sort of a good price for him, but then he said nothing about it for a whole while. And then I asked him, like, hey, you haven't said anything about that. Is 65 the new incentive price? And then it's kind of crazy to think that this was this year and we were having that conversation because the price was below that. And he said, I don't know, the price might hit 75 and I might change my mind depending on how the market looks. So what is the incentive price is not... Like, there's no there's no answer to to that question. And what the incentive price is for him might not be the incentive price for another project and so on and so forth. And at the same time, I think uh, a more interesting question is 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 what is the uh, what is a timeline to production? Because whatever the incentive price is, we don't have a magic stick to bring production on online in two months. So that's uh well, yeah, I don't have a question here, but that's a point. No, no, I agree with you. I, I suppose the incentive price, because it's such a seller's market and because it's the market is so undersupplied and we have such a big gap in supply relative to demand going out in the next few years, the primary producers are basically sold out. The incentive price is pretty much up to the discretion of the sellers that have anything to sell. I mean, that's, yeah. So, so Borshoff and, uh, and, and Brandon Monroe and, and anybody else with these large development projects the incentive price is whatever price they want because the the utilities. I guarantee you, the utilities are calling them right now, um, and eventually they're going to. They're probably going to make a decision, a financing decision, updated feasibility studies, and and get things into gear. That's probably going to happen if they're not bought out. Um, so that that's coming. That's that's definitely coming down the pike. That's going to be a big signal to the market when these large, lower cost or um, uh, lower grade projects start to develop. I think that's going to be a pretty big market signal. Mm hmm. And it's that's a spot price that we're talking about here. But the Trade Tech reported its November month end uranium prices again. I believe it must have been today. I believe I saw it on uh, John Quakes' Twitter profile. And it was notable that the long term price is still quite a lot lower than the spot price, or at least it's being reported as lower than the than the spot price currently sitting. Again, it's currently being reported, not sitting, but it's currently being reported at sixty six. Because I also understand that that's, it's a very obscure price. Like there's not one thing that you can watch on a screen. And that's the thing that if someone wants to buy uranium, that's what they pay. As, as far as I understand from interviewing like Grant, Grant Isaac, CFO of Cameco, he tells me that it, it's sort of on a, a case per case basis. So what, what's uh, what, what's happening there? Is the long, long term price really 66 bucks? And why is it not following the spot if it is? That um, so I actually didn't see uh, trade text reported month end price, but sixty six is what was reported by UXC um, mm -hmm. as the long term price for the month end for November. Um, honestly, as far as investors are concerned, it's just a price to be ignored, pretty much. Um, it's it's what they say it is is the low offer of the month. So that could be a hundred thousand pounds at thirteen months delivery. I mean, it, it literally could be that, but th even that is hard to believe in a, a price where in a month during where we went from what seventy four dollars to eighty one dollars or something like that. <clears throat> so, how is sixty six even a low offer in the month of November? Well, that could be the floor price in a contract. And so, and that's pretty much what it is. Is it's a it's a point to start negotiations at. And if you're signing a contract with floors and ceilings, uh, sixty six is probably somewhere right around where we're going to see floors. It gives some downside production to the producers. Um, we're not going to see $66 again, I think, until, I mean, I don't know, maybe not ever, but uh, not anytime soon. Um, but as far as investors are concerned, it's it's an utterly irrelevant number. And what about the other, some of the other prices that UXC is reporting right now, conversion, enrichment, what are you, what are you seeing? Everything this month was up. Um, a couple of prices were flat. Everything else was up. Uh, conversion jumped up a lot. So conversion went, let's see, uh, from 41 to 45, both in North America and in the EU. It's a big jump, 10% jump in a single month. Um, uh, UF6 is up. EUP is up. SWU is up. SPOT is up. Everything is up. Um, the SPOT market and uranium is moving more now than the fuel cycle services. And this is something, of course, that pretty much everybody predicted, ourselves included, that um, after, especially after Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the concern for utilities in the EU and North America about conversion and enrichment, they went after that first. So it wasn't, they went after that not only because of Russia's 
influence on those markets, but also if you have supply concerns in general, you're going to go after the elements of the fuel cycle that are closest to fuel fabrication to make sure that you get what you need. But now that many utilities have secured their necessary enrichment and conversion, then they're going after uranium. And we're clearly seeing that. We're seeing that in the movement and the spot price of uranium. We're seeing that um, in the term contract signed. So we're now at almost 160 million pounds signed in long-term contracts this year. UXC claims that they report 80 to 85% of that market. So we actually probably have hit replacement rate for the first time since 2012, which is significant. There's about 10 to 12 RFPs for term contracts in the market right now. Some of those will get inked in the next two weeks before we hit the holidays. Um, so we're, we're probably going to officially hit that replacement rate or get close to it. And unofficially, we will definitely be above a replacement rate in terms of overall contracted pounds in the term market. It's a very, very active term market. And while we haven't seen a lot of contracts inked over the past few weeks, part of that has had to do with um, multiple conferences. Part of it has had to do with the Thanksgiving holiday. Part of it has had to do with the spot market movements. When you see the spot price go from the 50s in August to $81 right now, the market kind of goes, whoa, and, and everybody sort of steps back a little bit. But there's a lot of tenders on and off market discussions for uh, term contracts. Hmm. And the really interesting portion of this is that the vast majority of the contracts that have been officially inked and the RFPs that are currently out there right now are um, in the EU. So in some cases, that makes sense because the EU has been historically more reliant on Kazakhstan and Russia. Um, but in some cases, it doesn't make sense because the EU has more inventories than the US. And why is the US so important? It's 25% of global demand, uh, the 25% of global demand for uranium. So the US is still significantly uncovered in term contracts going out for the next few years. They have a lot of buying to do. And the buying that they do end up doing is going to move the price in this environment with uh, such little supply available. So that's something we're watching. We're going to start to see more RFPs being reported by U.S. utilities, and, and the price is going to move. You made a good point at the beginning there saying that um, you and, and, and a bunch of other people also predicted that the price, the spot price is going to follow the, the services price, so conversion, enrichment, so on and so forth. Is that something that we can also look at in the future for for a direction in the spot price? Because you say the, the prices are up, but they're not up as much as they used to be. Would that mean that the spot price of uranium, uranium would also start slowing down in a couple of months? It's hard to say. Um, I think that based on the uncovered needs of uh, utilities to secure uranium, we should see... Um, the volumes in the term market continue to be relatively high, and we should continue to see the price move significantly. Part of the reason why is that it's not just price movement following price movement. You also have to see the enrichment tails in the contracts. And so the, the contracts for enrichment that are being signed right now, late decade into the 2030s, um, that the utilities will be buying uranium to fulfill into those contracts over the next few years. Um, these are at much higher tails assays. So, so all other things being equal, that one element, which is the tails assay, significantly increases the amount of uranium that needs to be purchased. So the uranium that was purchased last year in the enrichment contracts that were signed <clears throat> two or three years ago, that was, let's say, purchased for contracts at 0.2 tails assay. Uranium is being purchased right now to go into enrichment contracts at 0.25 buying next year and the year after that to go into contracts that are signed at 0.3. This has almost like a hockey stick acceleration of the overall volume of uranium that needs to be purchased based on the fulfillment of these enrichment contracts. So not only do we have overall growing demand of total capacity of nuclear globally, year over year going forward, or as far out in the future you want to go, that's what's expected, right? Um, now we're looking at a three plus percent compound annual growth rate of total nuclear capacity. So on balance, even with a flat enrichment tails assay assumption, you have more and more uranium needed to be purchasing purchased on an annual basis. But when you add that, uh, that higher tails assay going into these contracts year over year, that number gets juiced up even more. So 
we don't expect the uranium buying or the price response to that buying to slow down anytime soon, even if we see conversion flatten out, enrichment flatten out, because it's the tails assay within those contracts. With all of that said, eventually at some point, we're going to have more Western conversion and more Western enrichment and those prices will fall and those tails assays will fall and there will be a delayed response in uranium. When is that going to happen? Four, five, six years from now, maybe. What is it dependent on? Just meet more, more, more capacity in the West? Pretty much, yeah. And and hearing directly from the operators of these facilities at NEI uh, last month, or I guess that was two months ago. Um, for example, the the operator of Converdine basically said shutting down that facility was, and these are his words verbatim, was very, very, very painful. Mm-hmm. That that was exactly what he said up on stage. Um, Three times these very, guys, very. what's that? Yes. Yeah, that's a lot. That's um, like what, what my wife says when I have to take out the trash. So like one time I'm very serious and I'm like, OK, she's not serious. But when it gets to three, I absolutely have to take it out or I'm in trouble. But yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, we we all everyone in the audience heard it in that time. Um, so but basically his, to his point, these guys are not in a rush to expand capacity and kill their own business. They expand capacity in some cases, if they don't have that capacity already booked into high price long-term contracts, they they potentially have the threat of killing their own business because they also don't know if 12 months from now, the world uh, is, is enveloped in peace and all of a sudden, uh, Russia's full capacity of conversion and enrichment is open to the West and everybody has forgiven each other. Now, you can probably sense my sarcasm. I, I wish that that would happen, but it's probably not going to happen. But if all of a sudden the Western utilities hand over fist have access to conversion and enrichment, and that happens right after Converdine and uh, Arano and Cameco have expanded capacity and Uranko's expanded enrichment capacity, um, then these guys are hurting again, and they don't want to set that up for themselves. So they will expand capacity. The enrichments are already talking about it. Um, conversion, we're looking at Springfields. Westinghouse is looking at Springfields in the UK. Converdine can expand. They can expand relatively quickly and relatively cheaply. There's a couple of, you know, there's kind of some hair on that story, which is in Metropolis is owned by Honeywell, and honey, and, and that business is a drop in the bucket for Honeywell. They don't really even care about it. In fact, it was difficult to convince them to restart Converdine. So um, that expansion might happen, but the industry is not counting on it. So we need a lot. We need higher prices still. It's it's crazy to say that, but we need higher term prices for conversion and for these uh, entities, for Arano and uh, Arano, <clears throat> Converdine, and Cameco to see more booked high price conversion contracts in order for them to expand. Enrichment, that's being worked on. We've got some various elements of laser enrichment that's maybe will help five, six, seven years out. Um, Uranko and Arana are talking about expanding enrichment. So that relief should come, but that's still three, four, five years out minimum. Mm. And so this is getting me thinking and give me some rope here. It might not make too much sense, but it's so on one side, could that be the bottleneck that is 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 causing U.S. utilities not to contract as much because they want to, because if I understand it correctly, they contract uh, enrichment and conversion before they contract uh, yellow cake. And so on one hand, I'm thinking, could that be the bottleneck that is stopping them or slowing their contracting down? And then on the other end, I'm thinking, um, you know, could could we look at that for, for, for the end of this investment thesis as an investment? Uh, when it happens, because that's gonna, you know, have us go back from overfeeding from overfeeding a lot to overfeeding a little less. So th- th- there's two things that actually, I guess, they make sense on their own, but not necessarily in tandem. Again, I don't, yeah, what do what do you make of this? So the U.S. utilities are are much more well covered with enrichment than they are with U three hundred eight, and all utilities are. To your point, securing those enrichment first, conversion technically second, sometimes first, depending on that bottleneck, and then they get the uranium. Um, I think, so the large utilities in the US are decently covered. Um, They're usually kind of first movers. Um, They, uh, at least for the, let's say the midterm, they're, they're not in any sort of dire straits, right? But it's this has sort of been the way that the U.S. utilities have operated historically. They hold less inventory than the EU, and they tend to move less quickly with these things. So I think that the U.S. utilities have been 
a little bit more uh, cautious about jumping into the term market, perhaps hoping that the situation rectifies itself with with Russia. Um, perhaps they could go back and buy more uranium from Kazatomprom uh, and their joint ventures. That's been a little bit problematic with the shipping issues. But um, they're, they're just typically kind of, that's just how they operate, a little bit less, um, let's see, a little bit less visionary and uh, kind of last to move. And it's not necessarily... It's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just how they operate. And historically speaking, that's worked out fine for them. Um, but now we're in this situation where we've got a very um, a very tight supply element going out a few years from now. As far as the underfeeding, overfeeding thing, um, <clears throat> underfeeding, so again, at, at NEI, there were representatives from Uranco and Arano, the two primary Western enrichers. And they both said that neither of them are overfeeding currently. Um, I don't entirely buy that because I believe from what I've heard, uh, Uranco has been in the market buying conversion in uranium. Um, not necessarily hand over fist, but maybe a little bit. But either way, even if they haven't been overfeeding, Uranco confirmed zero underfeeding. Uh, or Arano confirmed zero underfeeding. Uranco said that they've significantly reduced how much underfeeding they're doing and almost to the point of not doing it at all. So Western underfeeding was about 10 million pounds a year. Uh, that's basically gone. So mm -hmm. we've been we've been right about that. As far as overfeeding goes, over what's stopping overfeeding is conversion capacity. Um, the enrichers can't can't overfeed if there's no UF6 to buy. Now, and we do know that the enrichers, well, Arano enriches and converts. So they've got access to their own conversion to some extent. But Uranco has to go out and buy it. And they have been large. Uh, consumers of conversion. So the Western converters, uh, let's say Cameco, Arano, and Converdine have sold a decent amount of conversion to the enrichers. Mm. Um, with all of that said, they just can't go out and buy a bunch of UF6 and, and overfeed their centrifuges right now because it's just not there. So that's limiting overfeeding. But in my personal opinion, the biggest swing when it comes to enrichment is these transactional tails assays for future enrichment. That's what the utilities have to buy year 308 to fulfill into that. So assuming a utility has purchased an enrichment contract at 0.3 tails, they've got their conversion covered. They've got to go out and now buy 20% more uranium than they would have had to at 0.2 tails. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of... I'm slow here because I'm I'm trying to think about the other thing that I said that once those enrichment facilities are back on, could that be the end of the thesis? Is again as an investment because this this thing is is mostly sentiment driven, right? Um, maybe not the end of high uranium prices, but is that the end of this? I don't know if I'm making any sense. It's late here, so give me. Yeah, some yeah. Time. No, I I understand what you're saying. You're you're basically asking new enrichment and conversion capacity to come online. Is that sort of the end of the price rise environment for U308 and therefore the yes. investment? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, I'm, I, I want to echo something that was said in a recent report from Gehring and Rosenzweig, which I highly recommend you check out if you haven't already. And they basically touch on <clears throat> uh, here. I'll just read it. I'll read this one paragraph. If that's okay. Sure. They, they, first of all, they talk about you know the, the positive fundamental thesis for the uranium uh, investment. Despite the favorable outlook, we find it helpful to consider what factors will eventually spell the end of the uranium bull market. Demand destruction is unlikely. That's an interesting short statement. They don't go into it any further than that. But it's important to think back at the previous market, right? So we had the crazy bull market, 03, 04 to 07. Then we had, of course, the, the financial crisis that brought everything down. Um, hedge funds, I think uh, they even mentioned somewhere here, what was it, Goldman? And one of these major hedge funds uh, uh, held 15 million pounds of uranium, dumped that off their books, right? So yeah, funds were dumping, uh, de-risking across the board and anybody that held uranium dumped it because of the GFC. Um, and that spelled the end of that price spike. But then the price started to recover. We still had a technical bull market in the commodity following the GFC. Um, but then after the Fukushima Daiichi accident, March, uh, March 2011, Japan shut off all the reactors. You know the story. It was a demand destruction um, spurred bear market. 
And that caused the bear market that lasted almost a decade was destruction of demand. It wasn't necessarily an oversupplied market. It became oversupplied because of all of that demand that fell off. Okay. So for them to say demand destruction is unlikely, that's, that's a wild statement to think about because what would cause demand destruction? Well, what caused it last time? A nuclear accident. Okay. Then you start to sort of pontificate on another nuclear accident. If that were to happen, statistically speaking, it absolutely could. What would happen if that did? Well, short-term equities tank in the short term, right? Everybody knows that. It's going to hurt sentiment. It's going to hurt it bad for the short term, for a day or two or a week until we understand the implications of the accident, right? This is, this is all just speculation, but what would cause demand destruction in this environment? Everybody is clamoring for more energy right now. Energy security is paramount. COP28, triple nuclear by 2050, uh, green everything, climate panic, uh, energy security, national security, baseload power, electrify everything, electrify your cooking, electrify your transportation, electrify your heat. That's where everything is going right now. So what's going to destroy demand? I don't know. I, I tend to agree with them. I don't see it. Even with a nuclear accident, are we going to see 10% of global demand come offline in the 12 months like we did with Japan? Probably not. Probably mm. not. It's not something I want to see. So I'm knocking on wood heavily. Um, but that statement is interesting. Okay, let me continue this paragraph if I can. Demand destruction is unlikely. Uranium demand is highly priced inelastic. Unlike a coal or natural gas power plant, nuclear reactors are much more sensitive to capital costs with fuel making up only 5% of total expenditures. That's not true, actually. Uranium is only about 5%. Fuel itself is more like 15%, but mm -hmm. I'll, I'll give them a pass. <clears throat> Particularly once a reactor is running, the operator is willing to pay almost any price for the fuel necessary to keep it running. Absolutely true. Furthermore, Regulated utilities own most nuclear reactors and can pass fuel costs on to rate payers. All right. So it continues into the next paragraph. But it's only the first sentence I need to read. Instead, uranium will likely peak once high prices increase mine supply. I actually think that is probably the most likely case. Now, between now and then, we could again see a spike and a fall back down. That is possible. So what is the supply that is going to end this bull market? Well, you can look at miners and then you can look at enrichment. Enrichment is going to aid that supply situation because once we have more enrichment capacity online, the tails assays are going to drop. The uranium that needs to be purchased to fuel into those enrichment contracts will be less. If they drop back down to 0.2 instead of 0 0.25, 0 0.3, or even higher potentially, it's less uranium that needs to go into the uh, total demand picture. But also if you have excess enrichment capacity like we've had over the past decade, you get a lot of underfeeding and underfeeding is a significant source of secondary supply. Up until the last couple of years, we had 25 pounds a year of underfeeding. That's a big ass mine of uranium, right? Then we have potential laser enrichment being a small mine, potentially turning into a bigger mine, but we're talking 2030s for this to really be significant. So what is the supply that can end this bull market? <clears throat> Next Gen's Arrow, Denison's Phoenix, along with Next Gen's Arrow, Mongolia ISR with the French, that's late decade, early 2030s. Not huge, but that's something. Um, Uzbek's expanding. That is going to happen. Kazakh's expanding. We'll see. I know they're going to try. Are they going to hit, you know, I, I, they're not going to hit 30 and a half and 31 and a half thousand tons in 2025. Mm -hmm. I, I will make a very large bet on that. Um, I guess I, in some ways I am betting on that. Um, so you have to look at the potential mine supply that's going to end this bull market. And you have um, all of these potential mines. If everything in Namibia comes online, Arrow is online, Denison's online, Mongolia is online, Uzbek's ramp, Dasa's online, Kazakh's ramp. Then we're in the late decade and we have a situation where if everything goes right and all of these guys are producing, then we've got a pretty abundant supply situation. We're going to see prices level off and probably fall. Hmm. But yeah. that's not happening in the next three, four, five years. It's just not. Well, first of all, thank you for asking my question for me and then also answering. That's kind of a nice podcast. I can basically just record you and I don't have to do anything else. <laughs> but, so, but so again, it, it's uh, it's really a time question more than it is a price question or, or, or 
any other dynamic. Like time seems to be yes. the most important dynamic in in this, in this whole thesis. And so if you look at the state of the market as it is right now, it sounds to me that you're basically agreeing with what the likes of uh, Rick Rule and John Champaglia have told me most recently, which was that we still have a few years of, of fuel left in this market. And so I guess with that, it also it also may be worth talking about what what stocks you think will be performing from here on. Obviously, out of respect for your paying members, who are not going to be mentioning any specific names. But are those going to be the companies that can supply that demand in the meanwhile, or are those the companies that are hoping to be able to supply? It? As in, what I'm asking here is developers, producers, explorers, something else. What are you looking at? Um, we're looking at the market soon likely shifting to the outperformance of developers and explorers. Um, so us specifically, we really like developers. We like companies that are going from uh, going from a proved out asset. So you're not, it's not necessarily a drill play. So a proved out asset that can actually produce cash flow during this bull market. And, you know, there's not a lot of companies in that category. So if you're watching this, you probably can figure that out. But those are the companies that we like. We like real companies, basically. Um, so far, Cameco has crushed everything. The near term or the existing producing companies, and to some extent, the large cap developing companies like NextGen has done very well also. But uh, Sput, which tracks the spot price and the actual companies that are producing, which are so very few, Cameco, because Adam Prom, because Adam Prom has a jurisdictional discount applied to it, but um, the stock has done uh, definitely well over the past few months, especially with ETF flows. Um, but the large, the large institutional investors, <clears throat> Cameco is a one-stop shop. Um, they cover all elements of the fuel cycle at this point, besides enrichment. Even though Cameco owns a minority share in global laser enrichment, um, that's still that's not enriching yet, but besides that they've got uranium they've got conversion and now they have fuel fabrication with the westinghouse deal so it's an easy stock to purchase it's liquid it's large cap and that's what institutions are going for and the chart shows it uh besides that we think it's high time for money to start rotating and to see some outperformance of the developers um and the and the small cap explorers and historically speaking around these prices for uranium and i guess I guess we would have to do an inflation adjustment to the, that historical um, context, but somewhere in this ballpark is when we start to see that outperformance really get some torque. And this also kind of has the classic tropes of a commodity investment where you see you know, the early stages of a, of, a, of a mining sector, you see the large caps move first. And that's always the case. Why? Because it's the smart money positioning first. And so, and the smart money goes after what's liquid and large. Um, and that's usually how it works. And then when you have a speculative frenzy start to come in, then you'll start to see the outperformance of the small caps and mid caps. And we think that's what's what's coming next. I um I met Warren Gilman this this week in, it must have been last week in Frankfurt at a conference. Very sharp, Queens Road, yeah. Absolutely incredible gentleman. So for people not knowing, um, he's a, he's a CEO of Queens Road Capital. It's a, it's an investment, it's a publicly listed investment company, and they invested what $70 million into next gen, I believe. And Warren also sits on on the next gen board. So he's a mining engineer too. He's got, uh, as you said, more experience in this sector than I've been on this planet for. Literally, he's got over 30 years of experience. So literally, but as so I asked him, like, why? I mean, why next gen? It's it's not a perfect company. That's how I started my question, which was kind of hostile. Uh, I'm not sure he liked it, but he that's what he said. He said liquidity. He you know he talked about. Uh, we also talked about the um, kind of the flashy marketing budget that they have as well. And he sort of explained these things to me that it's really all about liquidity, and it it wouldn't make sense if a uh, uh, another company would be doing this type of marketing because next gen has the liquidity to. He said like if you know, he said okay. If it's not next gen, here's seventy million dollars. Put it into one or two companies for me because that's sort of the strategy that that Queens Road has is very focused. Who are you going to put that money in if it's not next gen? You do want the upside, so not necessarily chemical, but who are you going to put it with? And so liquidity was um was basically what he explained to me. So that's a good point. Um, yeah, yeah. No, go liquidity ahead. is paramount. No, for large investors, liquidity is paramount. I mean, I'm sure you've heard. John Champaglia say, uh, you know, over and over that he speaks with very large multi-billion dollar asset managers that are 
interested in the uranium story. They just can't touch it yet. Uh, Sput is getting better. Like Sput, I think traded, he, he mentioned, I think in an interview with you, he mentioned that it traded $80 million in a single day in the past couple of weeks. Right. Um, so liquidity is improving. Uh, as the liquidity improves across the sector, we're going to see larger and larger players come in. And some of that's going to trickle down and the liquidity is going to improve across the board um, because uh, some of the liquid vehicles are the ETFs and the ETFs definitely buy everything that they own. And that moves uh, the entire, you know, the entire flywheel effect across the sector. So um, as the sector grows, that size will be get size. And the first to move typically are the large caps. We've definitely seen that. So, so far, that's what we're seeing. Um, we still think we're going to see uh, an outperformance of the small caps. Right, right. And you've, um, I don't know if that's okay to say, but so feel free to cut me off. But you've recently, not going to give away any names or something like if people want to know, they can go to uraniuminsider.com, of course. But you've also recently started buying some of these smaller companies. Uh, even I believe an explorer was on there. And so the fact that you, that, that, you're doing that is is also interesting to me is that was that more of a, a a company specific thing or do you think that explorers specifically like companies who don't yet maybe have a defined ore body uh or companies who are not well not not developers basically do you think they will see more love going forward or is it going to take a while before that happens well the explorers are tricky right uh especially with a very very small cap explorers um, they're in a, in a tight spot, especially with dilution, because mm -hmm. in, in order to even have a very, very small drill campaign, you need to raise a few million dollars. And if that's 20% of your market cap, that's a big dilution. Um, so that's, that's a problem for small capital explorers. And especially when they get so small that they're dumped from the ETFs, they don't have the share price appreciation when the sector runs like everything else does. It's a tough game for, for small, uh, small cap explorers. So um, we don't we don't really like to speculate on exploration drill plays, hmm. um, but yes, I mean our money is where our mouth is. We definitely have um, more exposure to the to the mid cap developer range than we do to the large caps, and part of that reason is torque. We like to have torque, and and we think we're going to see it. We've been biding our time this year. Certainly, every Cameco has outperformed everything, um, but uh, we think that that's going to reverse. Not that Cameco is going to go down necessarily. This is a strong stock and a strong sector and the bull market continues. But um, buying Cameco here, are you going to get the same torque as you would buying a three, four, five, six, seven hundred million dollar developing company? Uh, absolutely not, in my opinion. Right. It's but if you, if you have liquidity requirements, might be your only option. That and SPUT and UEC and the ETFs. Like It's all you can buy. And next gen. It's also about position sizing, I assume, um, because someone someone told me this, I'm paraphrasing, but someone told me that if you want to gamble, that's okay under two conditions. You you realize that you're gambling and you don't do it with your next friend's money or you don't do it with, um, you know, most of your paycheck or something like that. So liquidity is, a, is a, something else that you look at. What else are, are criteria, some of the criteria that you use to judge what goes into the portfolio versus what doesn't? Well, I think the likelihood of succeeding with their projects um, is one thing, and that's that takes a little bit more, I suppose, intuition and and digging into the company and speaking with management, getting on the phone, getting on Zoom calls with management, and and understanding um, exactly what their plan is, um, what have they been able to pull off in the past. We of course look at the financial situation of the company. You got to know whether or not they're going to be raising money anytime soon again. What is their cash position? What is their spend? What's their burn rate? Um, how much money they're going to need to accomplish what they aim to accomplish. You know, all these things are considerations. Jurisdiction is is important. Um, we really like the U.S. here. I think uh, looking at the U.S., seeing that the U.S. utilities are uncovered, uh, relatively speaking, looking at the resurgence of nuclear uh, support in the U.S. is very exciting. And looking at the fact that this year in the United States probably produce a few hundred thousand pounds of uranium, and the U.S. utilities are going to consume 45 million pounds of uranium. Huge upside for United States uranium producing companies, in my personal opinion. So we like that jurisdiction. But just generally jurisdictions, we don't like to gamble on jurisdiction um, in terms of buying a company who has a great project in a place that has not produced uranium ever or in a place where uranium production is currently illegal and having that shift and hoping that it shifts during this bull market. It's too much of a risk for us. So we don't like jurisdiction gambles. So looking at outstanding share accounts 
and looking at um, outstanding warrants and options, I think is something that almost all retail investors overlook. You have to look at what's coming down the pike in terms of selling pressure based on those two things. Um, also potential cash flow from those things. Um, historical dilution and what that dilution has led to for the company. Has it been accretive? Has it hurt shareholders? Those are very important to look at. Mm. Uh, management management is key. Always management's always key. Um, and then of course the assets. And, and you have to find a balance between all of those things to inform the decision of where you want to park your money. Thank you for being so generous. By the way, thank you. you you're giving away uh, quite a lot of good information here Pleasure. Um, that you t typically don't do. So I appreciate that. Uh, we also talked about sort of a potential exit out of the out of out of the sector as a whole uh, earlier on. But how do you? Because because in the meanwhile, I also see you you do trades here and there within your portfolio. You take some stuff in. You take some stuff out as one should do. How do you choose when and what to sell? Is, is it based on a percentage of a run up or a position sizing or company fundamentals or something else? Sure. Um, thus far, based on the perceived stage of this investment, we haven't done a lot of trading in and out of companies. Um, we have sold companies for fundamental reasons mostly. Uh, we have done a number of rebalances where we've reallocated some money from companies that have outperformed others in the portfolio and reallocated that into some of the companies that have underperformed in the rebalance. Um, we just recently did one. Uh, we did one about a month and a half ago uh, that turned out to be great timing. Um, mm -hmm. So that that worked out well for us. As far as how to trim and when to trim, it's such an individual question. Um, you're asking me and I have to think about not only my own personal positioning, but I have to think about our readership and our membership and what is best for them. So it's, it's a difficult question to answer, but I think generally speaking, you're going to want to pay yourself on the way up and try to not ride a fully allocated portfolio to the very top of the market, because it's going to be very difficult to time that perfect top. So uh, I think taking some risk off the table when the market is hot is is important. Um, and that's probably something that we will do. Um, potentially even do on the next run. It depends. Is, yeah. Sorry for interrupting here, but the, sure. the, it, this is sort of the, the free ride, right? That that uh, Rick Rule likes talking about. Lobo Tigre too. Apparently both of them have actually already done that uh, within Uranus. So be, they, their positions are basically free, which is always nice, of course. I like free. But how would you do that? Like, would you just tell, take small portions each step of the way? Like how would that work more specifically? Oh yeah. Scale out in tranches for sure. Yeah. Mm. Scale out. Oh, and, and how, like, is it a 20% thing or 20, like it's, how? it wouldn't depend on the amount that we're up on a position. It would depend on where, where the stocks or that individual stock is at um, technically speaking and where we feel the market is at generally speaking um, in a leg up. So if things are getting pretty frothy and overbought and we feel that it's a time to take some profits, then we'll look at the individual companies and make an assessment at that point. Um, but taking full profits and attempting to re-enter a company that we want to continue to hold for the what we believe will be a continuation of the bull market is not something that we do. We don't trade in and out of companies like that. Um, we, we have some overweight positions where we trim those to full weighted positions on the next super strong leg up maybe, but, uh, yeah, you have to look at high volume up days when the market is getting frothy, when sentiment is very high. Um, when people love you and love me and they're expressive about that on Twitter, that might be a little bit of a sell signal. Um, when I'm being trashed on Twitter and on YouTube, that's usually when I personally, um, aggressively buy. Uh, that's been a really good signal. Um, it's worked every time. Uh, so yeah, it's 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 hard to say. There's so many things to look at. More than anything, what we focus on, Antonio, is just um, keeping tabs on the physical market because that's what's going to signal a pause or a potential reversal in the price movement of uranium itself. And that's also going to be probably a big signal to take some money off the table. Mm -hmm. So we, we want to keep tabs on that, which is what we do. Um, and that's what we express to our membership more than anything is what the hell is going on in the physical market, because you get a price print on the screen that you can see on Twitter and you can see all the stories being shared around by everybody. But 
um, being able to talk to somebody and say, Hey, um, I'm trying to get a hundred thousand pounds and they keep raising the ask right now. Or, uh, somebody just brought 2 million pounds into the market, $2 below spot. Okay. You know, those kind of things, when I can hear that from our contacts and be able to express those things to our membership, that's where I think the value really comes in. Um, knowing what's going on in the physical market is absolutely, absolutely paramount for this trade. I also find a good gig of sentiment to be um, M&E, so mergers and acquisition. I think we might, well, I think we're eventually going to have to start seeing more mergers and acquisitions. Like, for example, what's happening with consolidated uranium and ISO energy is sort of that, but really weak. I mean, that's that's not that's not strong M&A act- activity. I'm, this is not a comment on the deal itself, but the, just on, on the M&A activity. And hopefully, actually, we see more of the M part of the M&A, because I think there's just too much GNA being spent for too little progress in these companies. Mm-hmm. But that's a tangent I'm saving for Christmas Eve dinner with the in-laws. And but so how do you how do you think about mergers and acquisitions when they happen to companies in your portfolio, is it a case per case basis, or do you have sort of set rules relative to M and E? Case by case basis, for sure. Mm. Yeah, yeah, because it depends. I mean, <clears throat> if it's a takeout, it's not necessarily an automatic sell. Uh, you know, it's it's it depends on who's doing the takeout and what their plan is going forward and how much life is left in this market. I mean, those are the, kind of the questions to ask. And I guess the price of the deal, if it, if we own something that's gets taken out at an extreme premium and we're not exactly ecstatic about who's buying, then it's probably a sell uh, on the takeout announcement. Um, as far as mergers go, yeah, of course, it's case by case. Um, and I, I do think we're going to see more, more M&A for sure. What I'm most excited about on that front, and I don't have any specific evidence of this coming down the pike here, but... Um, I would really like to see some multinational mining corporations, potentially some energy companies, uh, possibly even oil and gas companies coming after. Um, I mean, I would love to see like uh, a major oil company buy next gen or something like that, you know, like just to see that type of acquisition, I think would just bring such incredibly positive um, energy and attention to this sector and to this trade. So I've got my fingers crossed for something like that happening. Historically speaking, um, there's plenty of precedent for that. There's plenty of precedent for that. So, uh, you know, one, one of the fuel fabrication facilities in, uh, in, I think it was in Washington state was, um, was previously owned by, I think it was Exxon Mobil. I mean, these are, th- this has happened before in the past. I would like to see it happen again. We've already seen, you know, some blowups in terms of energy companies having allocation to wind energy. Um, okay. We tried that. That didn't work. What is working? How about we diversify our energy portfolio into what is working? See where the puck is going here with all of this, um, all of this positive momentum for nuclear. I think it happens, and I, I think when it happens, it's going to be very, very exciting for the sector. Right. Um, you make a very good point because that's something that's not been happening a whole lot. Well, that's not been happening in a while, actually. Uh, at all in the sector, although it does happen in other sectors, like in other sectors, you'd see, you know, Glencore take out um, some copper, um, some copper producers, stuff like that. Just generally big companies would take out smaller companies. So that's a question that I always ask when I'm talking to uh, the gold and copper guys or whatever. It's like, you're obviously building a takeover target here. Um, who do you think is going to take out? Like who's snooping around in that part of the world? And uh, those questions are not like, because because when you ask next gen, who's going to take you out? Cameco has said multiple times that that's not necessarily something they are actively pursuing right now. Um, so it would make sense that it's somebody else. And then there's also a couple of pictures that have surfaced of uh, BHP trucks in, um, in, in the Athabasca region. Mm. I mean, a billion things. But they're snooping around, and that snooping around means a lot. So, do you yeah. do you necessarily buy companies that you think will be taken? Like, do do you ever buy takeover targets specifically for that reason? No, not really, not really. I mean, I would say that we might continue to hold a company with a takeout being a likely outcome, but it's not necessarily at the top of our list for reasons to own a company. Um, we we think that a lot of companies that we do own based on the criteria I've already mentioned, are ripe takeout targets in the future. 
if this sector does continue to move in the direction we believe it will. A company that actually can get into significant development and actually produce uranium and, and produce cash flow is going to be a target. Um, so yeah, no, it's not necessarily top of mind as criteria for new investment thesis, but um, usually the companies that we like for the reasons that we like automatically make them pretty attractive takeout targets. Mm. Yeah. Okay. It, it, it's again, quite different than, than, than the gold and copper sector, at least when it comes on to takeover targets. What, right. what, is some, what about some of the um, alternatives? We sort of talked about uh, producers, developers, and also explorers. But what about some of the alternatives as in sort of the, the, the picks and shovel plays, if you will? Uh, there's not that many of them actually in the uranium space, but it, is that something you've looked at? Just explorers generally? No, no, the the, the sort of the, the picks and shovels, so like service providers who provide services to the explorers, for example, or gotcha. someone asked on Twitter about, for example, the shipping companies that would transport mm -hmm. the uranium around the world, stuff like that. No, not really. I'm not really interested in in kind of getting too deep into the weeds and all of the other various elements because, well, A, I don't think that there are very many options for investment in the other elements of the fuel cycle or other aspects of the nuclear trade. Um, and B, because we're so focused on the physical uranium market, we believe the miners really will have the torque and, and will have the torque going forward anyway. So that's where our focus is for the most part. Right, right. Um, may maybe a s slightly different topic, but it's kind of related. It's going to make sense here in a second. But I started thinking about the, the alternative nuclear and sort of small modular nuclear reactor stocks. And um, I know you have an opinion there, but this also maybe could turn into a more broad discussion about SMRs as a whole, what, what they will be and what they will not be. Because... We recently saw a company, um, I believe they're called Oklo. They're not a publicly listed company as far as I'm aware. This is sort of the, this is the uh, Sam Altman backed SMR builder, which also got a military military contract for, was it $100 million or something along those lines to build an SMR in Alaska. But then they, they're potentially not going to end up getting that money. There was some news recently, not, or at least not as much as they had hoped for or something among those lines. There's also a bunch of red tape coming to light again surrounding SMRs. So, uh, you know, I, I know you say that we don't need any more catalysts is what you said on Twitter, but it'd be, you know, it'd be nice to have SMRs increasing demand for uranium as well. But it seems like there's some roadblocks, if you will. And um, so this is this is basically a two-part question and basically maybe even two questions like, what about SMRs? Are, are they still going to be a thing? But also what about the SMR? stocks and uh, this is not the ticker symbol smr that we're discussing we're discussing companies who are involved in the small modular reactor business so yeah sure well i'm glad that you separated it into two questions because it really is two questions you know mm -hmm. um, the future of small modular reactors and the potential demand for uranium i think is still absolutely there uh, especially when you're looking at a global picture because when we're talking about the stocks we're largely talking about north american markets generally speaking and that so far has uh, gotten off to a rough start. Um, yeah. We've recently seen the X Energy um, despacking that was supposed to happen last month get canceled. The deal between, um, I believe it was Aries Acquisition and X Energy. <clears throat> and then we saw, uh, and largely that largely I'm sure was influenced by the performance of the new scale stock and their deal falling through with um, UAMPs the uh, Utah um, consortium of utilities. So that was that was definitely unfortunate to see that happen just for uh, just for the sake of small modular reactor builds in the United States. So there's I mean there's plenty I could go into with that, but I think more relevant to the question um, has to do with I, the future of SMRs globally so and the demand picture for that. And one of those things has to do with the Darlington build right now. They're building four uh, GE Hitachi BWRX 300s. They're already buying uranium for that. So we already are seeing demand for an SMR build in North America. Uh, so it's not really this potential sort of uh, way out there in the future. Maybe this will happen thing. It actually is already happening. Um, but we're also seeing a lot of new kind of renewed energy around large builds. Yes, the Chinese have been just building them like crazy, but we're looking at large reactors being built in Poland. They already have two that have been approved. 
Um, just a Bloomberg article this last week saying that there's multiple utilities in the United States looking at building new Westinghouse AP1000 large reactors. Uh, India is building large heavy water reactors. There's, you know, there's 60 something reactors under construction globally right now. All of those, except for one or two, are large reactors. So the total global build is still happening. SMRs, all we can really do is sort of speculate at this point and look at anecdotally what is happening in terms of letters of intent and memorandums of understanding being signed with the various SMR developing companies, engineering companies, and different countries or different utilities. And there's a lot of interest and a lot of positive energy going in that direction. So there is a program in the in the UK right now. I'm forgetting the name off the top of my head. It has some cute, uh, cute name. Um, either way, they're basically looking at four or five different SMR builders and trying to determine the best design for the UK government to support and building. Um, Rolls Royce is at the top of that list. And that's that's pretty exciting to see that. If we go by trade tech speculation, they believe that we're going to see 200 million pounds of uranium demand by SMRs alone out to 2035. So that's a lot just to add to the already robust demand picture from the existing and growing large nuclear fleet. Mm -hmm. As far as the investment case for SMRs, I think we're very, very early in that stage still. Um, it's gotten off to a rough start, like I said, with New Scale, with X Energy's uh, uh, deal with the SPAC going in reverse. Um, Sam Altman is behind the SPAC that is trying to do a deal with Oakwell. He's not mm -hmm. necessarily behind Oaklo itself. Um, but that that's one to watch. GE, uh, I believe that GE is actually going to spin out their small modular reactor company, and it probably is going to be public. That's something to look for. I don't know how soon that's going to happen. Maybe it's a 2024 story, something to watch out for. Um, this has a long ways to run, and we're we're in like we're we're in the in the warm-ups before the first inning for small modular reactors. Yeah. This, that, that's basically what I'm what I'm getting out there. I um spoke to Malcolm Rowlingson as well. I've been trying to get him back on, but his Twitter DMs are closed, so I have to sort of bug him in a different way. Um, because he deleted his account, whatever. And um, this is getting me thinking though about 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 government funding as a whole, not government funding for nuclear as much as because this is something that we have started seeing. Like almost every funding package of the DOE now includes nuclear in some type some some type of fashion that that was not a thing before so that's obviously good but and this may be jumping back to again to the miners uh specifically the u.s miners it's making me think about whether we're going to see more government funding or grants kind of like what we've seen for lithium i spoke to a couple of lithium guys here over the two conferences where you know they'd say me oh we got that much money from the government and i'd say what do you mean you got 60 million from the government they're just like we we got it we don't have to pay bills like it's free money basically it's when it comes down to like the meme do you think that that happens to uranium, and do you think that could be a play on the stocks as well? Well, we've already seen a little bit of support from the U.S. government with the uh, strategic uranium reserve and some purchasing from domestic producers. Right. Um, we're probably going to see more of that. It seems like, generally speaking, they've been more supportive of the other fuel cycle elements, specifically with enrichment. Um, it seems like they're supporting, uh, we're still waiting to see if the government is going to put out a RFP for HALU. I think that they will, and that's probably going to happen this month. Um, that's probably going to be awarded to multiple players, but clearly the government wants to get some HALU production going. And then that's, of course, is going to be helpful for future SMR builds <clears throat> in the United States and potentially for exports. I don't know. It's it's hard to say. Clearly, the United States government under this administration and the previous administration, but they really kicked it up with this administration, is super supportive of nuclear. So hopefully we can see we see that continue. Next year is an election year. Um, ideally, we see this energy and enthusiasm continue. As far as we're concerned, it's not something we put a lot of weight into um, just because the political winds can shift. And uh, so it's it's much less of something that we can hang our hats on uh, compared to just the overall supply and demand fundamentals for the sector globally. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with that. Also, something that Lobo Tigre has told me before is that if if your thesis, I mean, if if you need the government for your investment to work out, then that that might not be the best you know investment to be in, especially if it's a 
if it's a company, but I mean, it'd, it'd be nice if some of these companies literally got free money, which again, is what's been happening to some of these lithium, lithium right. companies. So, um, yeah, what else? I'm looking at you. I've got your Twitter profile here. I'm trying to come up with more topics, but it seems like we've been at it for a while. What else am I, uh, what else am I forgetting to bring up? I don't, I don't know that you're missing anything here. Um, I, yeah, I, I, I think just going back to what, what UXC was uh, writing about this week, we subscribed to their weekly product and, and they highlighted, you know, the significance of breaking $80 spot and kind of dug into what exactly is going on here. And, and the primary point that I took away from what they wrote, and really it's just sort of kind of back ends the work that we've done and, and some of our colleagues have done in the sector, which is you can model out and understand how much buying is ahead of us and set that against the production shortfall and how much material is really available in the market. Um, even though we've gone significantly higher in uranium price, we've never been more confident that the price is going to continue to move higher. And I've been saying that for the last 18 months, and it's it still is true, even though the price has doubled. Um, it's going higher. We have such a strong demand picture for the commodity, and we're years away from supply being able to fill that gap and actually... Um, stem the tide in the price. How high it goes, I have no idea how high it goes. It's going to go higher than it needs to go. I can practically guarantee that. <clears throat> you have people that are doing logarithmic chart uh, uh, predictions saying it's going to go to $1,300 a pound. Like, you know, I'm not in that camp, but it's absolutely going to go higher than that marginal cost. And looking at $81 a pound, you know, you ingest that for inflation, it's about 55 bucks a pound in 2006. We have a long ways to go, even to match the previous market's run. And the previous market's run was during a period of time where there was not a supply deficit. It's astounding. Uh, it's astounding how this is set up. And honestly, compared to the price of the metal here, the miners are underperforming. They really are. And we think that shifts. And that's where our bet is. So we think we have an incredible upside here, especially for the miners. Um, it's not, I would say it's not quite as drastic as looking at, you know, some of the gold and silver miners uh, with with gold pretty much at all time highs and, and silver not necessarily there, but um, these stocks have been destroyed. The uranium miners have not been destroyed, but they have not kept pace with the, with the commodity. Um, and we think there's a lot of torque ahead for uranium mining stocks, uh, given that, we believe the price is heading much, much higher and probably soon. Hmm. Is that economy dependent too, or, or economic sentiment dependent too, let's put it that way, meaning could, could uranium go to triple digits next year and the miners crash just because we haven't had a rate cut or a zillion other things have happened in a macro where we have a recession or something else? I would say the miners crashing at $100 uranium is probably pretty unlikely, but I definitely think that the overall macro backdrop, um, you can say, well, Justin, the S&P is up. Yeah, it's up because of seven stocks. The overall macro backdrop, you can see it across Twitter. It's been doomed this entire year. Uh, I mean, everybody is saying that tomorrow is Black Monday part two. I mean, that's it's basically the sentiment that's there. And everybody, there's a lot of people that I communicate with that... Um, have largely been on the sidelines for this uranium run because they're waiting for a market crash to enter into positions. I mean, that's that's a thing. And certainly that has affected the, the, the performance of the equities. I mean, the equities have done well this year. They've done very, very well this year. But compared to how the price has moved of uranium, would we expect that they would be significantly higher? Absolutely. So in a better macro backdrop, I do think they would be higher and I think that they will be higher, but those are, those are elements we can't really control. Um, you know, there's the smartest macro people, um, in the world are all feeling pretty cautious here about the market. You know, we're talking about the Druckenmillers, the world, et cetera. They're all kind of like, okay, uh, long bonds and cash you know, pretty much maybe buy some gold. So that's that's kind of the overall sentiment here. And uh, that's just where we're at. We can't control that. But what we can control is um, our, our study of the physical market, where the price is going. So we can make a strong bet on the price going higher and allocate uh, the, in the way that we see best fit for that. And we think on balance over time, it's going to prove to be a fruitful investment. Mm. It's interesting you should say that because it was... Um... 
we were what this is going to seem off topic but it's not <laughs> wife and i were watching the um squid game squid game the challenge like so that's basically squid game the 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 the, the show but then it's a reality tv show now and people are competing they were asking this woman at the beginning why she wanted to win and she was like oh you know a recession is coming and this and that and i was like okay so if you know if everybody is expecting it is it really gonna come um and that's and a good question i i ask myself that all the time it's like okay if the market crashes and we have a recession it'll be the most telegraphed recession in history everybody sees it coming does that is so is it actually going to come in the way that they believe probably not but i mean who knows yeah it's a good point it's a good point yeah. and, and um i was also trying to this is website it's called the stockcircle.com where you can see some of the um, some of the trades um some of the trades that family funds and just financial institutions do and you can see sort of the how much of given stock has been bought by institutions how much of it has been sold and and it seems like there's uh you know people preparing for this so when you open up some of the larger diversified miners like your volley for example or like even chemical chemical had in q3 of 2023 they had they saw 45 million uh, dollars sold by six institutions and 17 million bought by three they call them gurus on here but so yeah i mean as, as you said some of those people who are who 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 think bad times are coming or uh, have been selling you know we have uh, jim simmons is, has been vocal about this joe greenblatt um but then at the same time you have ray dalio and, and our, our most favorite kathy wood buying so it, i mean it's um i don't have a question here i'm rambling at this point so yeah i hear you it's it's a it's a tricky macro backdrop and uh the people that have been the most sure about a crash happening this year um, have been pounding the table, have been avoiding investing in the longs that they believe in because of that, have basically been wrong. Um, and I'm not I'm not taking a victory lap on that, but I'm just saying it's so hard for me to predict exactly what's going to happen on a macro uh, on, a, on a macro scale. But it's very easy for me to tell you that the price of uranium is going higher. So that's where I have my money. Um, you know, I, and I don't mean to be like macro be damned, but um, ignoring those forecasts has worked out for me. And uh, it doesn't mean that I don't keep some cash. It doesn't mean that when I've, when I'm feeling bearish that I won't short the market because I will. Um, but I can't not be long uranium here. I just can't not be long here. It's uh, uh, the, the price is going to continue to move higher. Right. Do you still have a hedge? By the way, uh, painfully, yes, I do. But I luckily I went out far enough on the curve, and it's a spread, so it hasn't. It's not down that much. But um, I'm going to hold it. I might, I might sell it on the next down wave for the queues. But yeah, right, right. Well, Small. We, did go, we didn't go into this because it, it was going to be easy. We went into it because we thought it was going to be easy. So I hear you there. Justin, this has been great. I don't think I'm, I'm not going to lose any more of your time. Um, th thank you so much for doing this. UraniumInsider.com for people who want to know more about some of the companies who we might have alluded to, but we didn't say out loud. And uh, yeah, thanks so much for doing this. My pleasure. Always good to chat with you, Antonio.